Perfect. We are now recording. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon to uh, discuss my favorite part of the world, which is the Canadian Arctic, but also a really big thanks to um, the team over at Merit Travel and, and uh, Jennifer Patterson. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, um, booking with a travel agent, I encourage this even before the current environment that we're faced with, but, but even more now, um, to have somebody on your side and in your corner, they're helping you through any tricky situations and making sure that you're making the right decisions is extremely important. Um, we still want to be out enjoying this beautiful planet that we all call home, but we want to be doing so in safe and comfortable fashion. And that's what you get when you hire an expert like those at Merit Travel. They will be with you every step of the way to make sure that you are kept safe and you're still having the level of enjoyment that you wish when you're going on one of these big, big life trips. So um, let's do a little bit of an introduction. Of course, let's talk about what I'm gonna talk about and then I'll talk about what I'm gonna talk about and then I'll wrap it up at the end. So first I want to introduce you to Adventure Canada and what we represent as a tour operator. Jennifer already did explain a little bit about our travel style, which is expedition cruising, but I just want to dive a little deeper in on that topic and why I am so personally fond of it. And then we'll get into the really, really good stuff and we'll take a deep dive on the destination, which is going to be the Canadian Arctic. So first of all, Adventure Canada is a true family owned and operated company in every sense of the term. So this photo that I am so fond of, this is my family here. So on the picture on the left, that is my sister Cedar in the white dress. She is our acting CEO. That's Cedar Swan, my big sis. And then to her right is my father, Matthew Sr. That's him holding his Lifetime Achievement Award that he recently won from the Tourism Industry Association of Canada and mainly for help, helping to develop tourism in the Canadian Arctic. Um, and then between myself and my father is my other sister, Alana Swan, and she is our uh, vice president of product development. So she gets to design a lot of our itineraries. And then of course, lastly is me there trying to look natural in a suit, which does not come natural at all, but I am doing my very, very best. And as you can see, I had a much more reasonable haircut than the one that I am sporting now in, in the times of COVID. So um, very, very proud to work with my family. It means a lot to me personally that I can work alongside them, but also what we represent as a company is one of the reasons why I'm so proud. So since our inception way back in 1987, so over 33 years now of operation, we have always been incredibly diligent in giving back to the destinations that we're traveling to. And right now I feel that that is more important than it ever has been. So we focus on how we can make a positive impact through regenerative tourism and sustainability planning. And um, everybody that travels with us can also feel that they're contributing to that because a portion of everybody's tour cost will contribute to the sustainability and regenerative tourism efforts. Um, so we've aligned ourselves with the United Nations uh, 2030 goals. As you can see here, we've selected a few and pinpointed on the map where we're supporting these efforts. Um, don't try and break your brain reading that graphic. Just know that you're, you're traveling with an organization that is uh, very focused on um, the planet's well-being and the people that call the planet home's well-being. And um, when we go on your itinerary with you, we'll do a deep dive on how your tour is specifically giving back to the regions that we travel to. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to work with a partner like Merit Travel because their sustainability efforts are second to none. They're a great organization and what they represent as a brand is extremely important. So I'm quite proud to, to partner with Merit Travel on a lot of our programs. So it would be a miss for me to talk about our sustainability plan and not mention our COVID action plan as well. I don't wanna dwell on these items, but I do think it's important to address. So now the expedition cruise industry is one of the most well-equipped and experienced when it comes to managing and monitoring health conditions of those on board our small ship. Outbreak prevention and response measures are in place year round and they've always been a part of our standard operating procedures. One of the benefits of expedition travel is our ability to break our guests into small subgroups. So um, we've, already, we've always been doing that, even though you're on a, a bigger community on the ship, when we're doing our different excursions and activities, 
we're, we're keeping people to very small group sizes, usually anywhere from about 15 to 20 people. Another benefit about our Canadian Arctic trips is flying north, we actually charter our own plane. So we do pre-screening before anybody ever gets onto the plane. And if there's any signs and symptoms, we can deny access to that. So before we even get close to the ship, we've already done a pre-screening and making sure that everybody is a-okay to, to join our program. Another big benefit about Adventure Canada's operation is the, the vessel that we operate on actually holds over 350 guests. But that's too big of a group for us. We actually, we've already minimized it for the last five years to 198 guests. So we're already operating at about 60% occupancy. And that falls in line with a lot of national regulations. And it really does help us manage um, the, the uh, spaces on board. And, and we're, we're able to um, social distance in quite an easy manner. Okay, so let's get on to why we embark on these journeys. We believe that uh, in the transformative power of nature, we travel with guests who are deeply curious about the world that we live in and take them onto some of the most extraordinary locations on this planet. We engage, we entertain, and we educate by connecting people to nature and to each other. We like to combine a curiosity for different cultures with a passion for exploration. So where do we go? We actually go all over the world. We, we do programs in Europe. We do programs in South and Central America. We head all the way down to Antarctica. Uh, but today we're talking about the Canadian Arctic and Greenland. No matter where we go, we head off the beaten path. I love this image here. We see all the big Great. city lights of, of Southern Canada. And look at Europe over there. It's just glowing. It's beaming. Beautiful destinations. But we stay away from all of that. We're always focused on the remote regions away from the big tourist crowds. Almost everywhere we go, we're, we're having our own exclusive experience where you're not going to run into other tour groups. That's very true. <laughs> yeah. It's important these days too. Yeah. So how do we go? Over the years, we've discovered that our preferred method of travel is expedition cruising. It's not like your typical large ship or luxury cruise. Uh, we deliver a program that provides our guests with an, an authentic and immersive experience in the destinations uh, we're visiting. The expedition is the main focus, so the destination is what we want to put all of our energy into. Uh, although we do have a very nice uh, uh, vessel, that's not our primary focus. Expedition travel is uh, characterized by its dynamic and fluid nature. We'll have a, an intended itinerary, but we are going to change that itinerary as much as we need to to make sure that our travelers are having the best experience possible. There's three main types of excursions. So one is a Zodiac cruise. These small, safe, uh, little reliable boats allow us to get up close and personal with some of the natural beauties, wildlife, uh, icebergs, glaciers, all of those beautiful things. Another uh, main type of excursion is when we go into a community and do a community visit. Here we'll conduct um, tours with local guides, always extremely important no matter what region we're in to be using local guides. And um, we're looking for opportunities for meaningful cultural exchange. We want people to understand not only what the history of the destination is and how people got here, but also what is life like currently? What's happening in present day and what are we expecting in the future? So we want to engage and interact with the folks of the region, of the towns, of the communities, and make sure we're understanding what life is life in this particular area. And then the third type of excursion is an expedition landing. So this is when we get off and we explore the land. We really, we really get to connect with nature. We'll offer a number of different hikes uh, with variations of, of difficulty. We're going to have extreme hikes for those that want to go scamping up a mountainside and get some big elevation gain and burn tons and tons of calories. There'll be options for them. We're going to have some more intermediate options where it's going to be a little bit of elevation gain, but stopping periodically to catch your breath, drink some water, enjoy the, the space. And then we do uh, excursions that are very leisurely as well, where you don't even have to walk more than a kilometer, but you're still going to get a, a high level of interpretation and get a deep understanding for the destination. So we have something for everybody. When you have 198 guests on board, there's no way that everybody's going to want to see the same thing and do the same things. That's why we break down into these smaller groups to make sure everybody's having that experience that they want. 
um, and that they have ultimately uh, signed up for. So with these uh, opportunities, um, it's really about finding your own personal space and making sure that you have that connection so that you can come home with a deeper understanding of the destination. So a key component to these expedition cruises is the staff. We carry, we don't bring on general guides, we bring on very topic specific specialists. So things that are a must on each one of our trips would be a historian, a marine biologist, an archeologist, an ornithologist, a botanist, geologist, uh, the geology is a very popular topic, especially in, in the Arctic. So we have all of those ologies, all of the sciences, but we also bring on photographers and writers to stimulate the creative side of the brain. One thing that I'm uh, very proud of is that Adventure Canada has a mandate for every seven guests, we'll have at least one expedition team member there. So you have a very high ratio. That way you get to engage in, in and connect with the staff as frequently as you want. You have lots of opportunities to direct the conversation that you want it to go in. So you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the staff. So much of our learning does take place on land, but it doesn't stop there. We also do a very thorough series of lectures and workshops on board the vessel. And so, as I mentioned, the sciences, the culture is also extremely important. And as Jennifer mentioned, we like to bring in the art side of things. So we'll have musicians, we'll have um, Inuit carvers and printmakers, uh, we'll have writing workshops, we'll have sketching workshops, so lots to do. One uh, very, very popular part of our program is our Nikon uh, lending opportunity. So this is a chance for all of our travelers. They can um, do a couple of things. One, they can borrow Nikon equipment. Nikon has sponsored our trips. They put on about 25 to 30 different types of camera bodies and lenses and our guests can borrow that equipment free of charge. You don't have to pay to use it for a couple of days at a time. Not only do you get to borrow the equipment, but we have a, a staff member that's specifically there to teach all of our travelers how to use the equipment, how to get the right angles, how to get the right landing, and it's all free part of your tour cost. So this is a, a very um, popular way to enhance your trip. You don't have to sign up beforehand. We have, we have plenty of cameras, plenty of lenses, and everybody has an opportunity to, to get a little taste. So all of those uh, excursions and activities and programs are included in the tour cost. There's a few that, that you'll have to pay a little bit extra for. One of them is kayaking, and here you're paying to rent the kayak equipment, but I can tell you it is an exhilarating experience. Just got to stop to let some people in there. Sorry about that. And then also, uh, in addition to the kayaking, we also have opportunities for mountain biking. So believe it or not, we have some Kona mountain bikes when you're up in the Arctic. If you want to do a little bit of cycling, no problem at all. You can get out and burn some extra calories doing some mountain uh, biking. To rent the, the bicycles also is, is an additional cost. The kayaking you want to book beforehand, but the mountain biking you can just book on, on board the trip. Okay, so the Ocean Endeavour. This is the vessel that uh, leads us through our Arctic expeditions. As I mentioned before, it holds 198 guests. Um, it's perfectly outfitted for Arctic travel. Um, I love how spacious she is. She has plenty of big open rooms and lounges. Uh, she has a fully stocked library. She has a sauna, she has a hot tub. All these wonderful things that you want when you're on a, on a vacation. But the, the best thing, the most important thing is she's purpose built to travel through these very difficult icy waterways. She's very, very strong. She's got um, a, a extra thick steel around her hull to make sure that she can navigate in and around ice and even bounce off of the ice and, um, and not be phased by it. Another benefit of the ice classification, the thick steel at the bottom makes it sit low. She's got a heavy bottom. So she sits low in the water. And if we have waves, her heavy bottom doesn't, she's hard to push around. So if you're concerned about motion sickness, this is a very good uh, vessel to, to explore further because um, she, she hardly, uh, hardly ever moves even when we do encounter rough weather. But I must say in the Arctic, and, and Jen, I'm sure you know this, the Arctic doesn't experience anything like uh, the Antarctic where you have the Drake exactly. Passage, mixing of all of those currents yeah. in the Arctic. You just have one current, it's a desert climate, very few storms, the waterways are usually quite calm. Same in your experience, Jen? Oh yeah, for sure. It's way, way, way calmer up north and in the south. But um, 
yeah, it's like, and you're closer to land usually. Um, so you're going to have less rough seas. And what's great about that, it means that you're going to be able to do more, hopefully more landings and stuff if the ice behaves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, yeah. we get pushed around less by the weather in the north than we do in the south. Yeah. I'm not going to go any deeper on the vessel. Um, to be honest, Jennifer is an expert on all expedition ships and in particular the Ocean Endeavor. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer probably knows my vessel better than I, than I even know it. So I'm just going to encourage you to reach out to the experts at Merit Travel and, and connect with them, discuss what your desires are, discuss what your wants are, and they will help you pick what is the right ship to travel on, what is the right itinerary for you, and what is the right cabin space. So I just encourage you to connect with Jennifer and the team. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, so that kind of sets the stage. Um, the Ocean Endeavor, it also does um, some uh, non-Arctic itineraries. So just quickly, we do stuff in, in the Basque Country, which is a little bit of Spain, a little bit of France. We're also doing a program to all of the uh, Scottish islands, the Inner and Outer Hebrides, the Orkney and the Shetlands. That's a wonderful itinerary. Then we have one um, that does Scotland to the Faroe Islands over to Iceland. And uh, Jennifer is hosting a, a tour group on that one in 2021. So uh, find out more about that. We also circumnavigate Iceland and then we head over to Greenland where we start our Arctic season. So um, here's just a snapshot. We do Greenland, we do high Arctic, we do sub Arctic, we do a lot of different itineraries. I'm only going to talk about the destination and why I love it so much. But again, just connect with your, your friends at Merit Travel and they will help you pick what is the right itinerary for you. So I just wanted to point out that um, like I've been selling a lot of the Arctic for ages and um, Adventure Canada have a lot of good routes for the Canadian Arctic. Um, there's not a, there's not as much um, selection up there, but these guys, they really focus on the Arctic. Um, and that's what I really like about them because there are trips that go through there, but you're, if you look at the number of days and where you go, um, you'll see, you'll get to see way more and um, immerse yourself in the Canadian Arctic with Adventure Canada's trips. Yeah, and one thing that's extremely important when traveling to these regions is have folks that are experienced. And our first tour 33 years ago was to the Canadian Arctic. This yeah. is our, our main product. We've been doing it for a very, very long time and we know it inside and out. So um, yeah, this is, this is kind of our, our specialty, if you were to say. Okay, so let's right off the bat. When you think of the Arctic, one misconception is, is that it's gonna be cold. It's actually not that cold, especially in the summer months. When we're looking at it like uh, July and August itineraries, we're hovering around an average of about 15 degrees Celsius. So it's not, it's not freezing. I love this photo here. Sarah's enjoying herself. She's just out in her fleece. She doesn't have a big down parka on. You don't need extensive amounts of gear in the summer months. So um, we can uh, erase that misconception that the Arctic is going to be a freezing cold place. It's not, it's not the truth. Um, I love this image because it's so hard to describe how big the icebergs are. Our vessel is 137 meters long and you can see this iceberg that's in behind it is quite a bit longer than our ship and then also quite a bit taller. So it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing to see these massive, massive unique sculptures all over the place, just riddled all through the waterways. Um, one thing to remember is that each iceberg is anywhere from about eight to nine tenths larger underneath the water than it is above the water. So just imagine how far this iceberg is stretching down towards the ocean floor. It's absolutely amazing to see. So the ice uh, is critical for the Arctic. Um, it attracts all the wildlife. So as our ice breaks up, it releases phytoplankton into the water, which attracts small fish, which attracts um, seals and so on the circle of life as as you have a food source everybody's going to congregate there together so we usually see the majority of the arctic big five in and around the sea ice and, and we spend a lot of time exploring these regions so um, i'm going to talk quickly about the arctic big five um, now of course the uh, the the icon of the big five is is the cute and cuddly polar bear there which is actually 
quite intelligent and, and dangerous. So we encourage you not to go and pet the, the polar bears, but they're absolutely wonderful animals to, to witness and learn about, learn about their hunting techniques, learn about their migration patterns and, and how they survive in this uh, very harsh um, environment. So we see them majority of the time we're on the bigger vessel and we can spot them from, from the decks or down on the bow. Um, now, usually it's about, you know, 30 to 50 meters away from the ship. So you're going to want to have um, binoculars and, and a good camera. But that being said, you still get good views. I actually took a shot of this right here on my iPhone. So you don't need to have fantastic, super expensive equipment to get good shots. But you do want to have binoculars with you and you do want to have um, your camera on hand for those viewings. It is a little more rare, but sometimes we do see them when we're out on the uh, zodiacs as well. Yeah. Also part of the Arctic Big Five is the walrus, tooth walkers. So they have these uh, ivory tusks. They're very graceful, they're large, they're graceful under the water, but uh, once they get up on land or on ice, they're a bit clumsy. So they actually use their, their tusks to, get, to help them get out, out of the water. They'll jump up onto the ice and jam their tusk right into the sea ice. And then they use their super large flippers and they try and brace themselves. And then they use their neck muscles and slowly advance and pull themselves out. It's quite an interesting thing to get to see out on, out on the land or out on the ice in the zodiacs. Another one is the muskox. We call it the bearded one. We usually see these guys up on the hillside and they have um, a tendency to hang out in herds. So you see quite a few of them at the same time. Again, this was just shot on my iPhone, so you don't need to have big cameras to get great looks at the, the musk oxen. Oh. Oh. So he, here's the unicorn of the sea, the most elusive of the Arctic big five. They're very hard to spot. Their tusk is uh, made of tooth enamel. So the vibrations from motors and in the water tends to, to scare them off. If you do get to see uh, a narwhal, consider yourself to be quite lucky and, and have great karma. And then the last of the big five is the beluga whale, much more common than the, the narwhal. Uh, we see these quite often throughout all of our trips in, in the Canadian Arctic. They're very social. Um, they like to hang out in large pods. We've seen uh, up over a hundred at a time. Uh, when you do spot them, you usually see quite a few at the same time. So that's the last of the Arctic big five, but it doesn't stop there. We still have uh, lots of other species, humpback whales, minke whales, Orca whales we're seeing more and more of as the ice continues to retreat. Um, plenty of different species of seals. Out on the land, we can hope for uh, Arctic hare, Arctic fox, uh, caribou. Now this is interesting, that Arctic hare is actually, it's not a cute little bunny. Arctic hare can be two and a half feet, three feet tall even. They're, they're quite large. They're the tastiest animal out on the land, so everybody wants to eat them. So they're very powerful, very fast. They can scurry away quite quickly. Lots of different seabirds and uh, migratory birds. So we'll spend a lot of time learning about them. Jeer falcons, um, ivory gulls, lots of uh, species that are hard to spot anywhere else. So for those of you that are into birds, a great destination for that. And then as I mentioned, the summer months have plenty of life, nice warm weather, which makes the Arctic tundra bloom. So you see these beautiful wildflowers with Arctic cotton, purple sagifrage, just littered all over the tundra. I've had uh, folks that we go off on uh, leading a hike. We don't get more than 100 meters because we spend all of our time on our knees taking photographs of these beautiful wildflowers that are just all over the tundra. And, and these flowers are like the size of your thumbnail and like Arctic poppies, so delicate and bright colors. They're just, just a, the tundra is amazing. It's yeah. a highlight for sure. Yeah. And it's riddled with life. Like mm -hmm. uh, you think of barren landscape, not true. Yeah, it's actually, true. It's, it's riddled with life. You just uh, got to know where to look. Yeah. Okay, so moving away from the natural history side, we'll talk a little bit about the, the polar explorers. So similar down south, you hear of Shackleton and the race to the South Pole. There's a lot of stories that um, are along the same lines in the north. One famous one for all of our Canadian listeners um, is Sir John Franklin, where they found the, um, they recently found the, the two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. Um, so uh, we visit into the National Historic Sites, learning about the polar explorer's history, trying to find that uh, safe passage to trade commodities from 
Europe over to Asia back and forth. So there's lots of very rich history as far as polar explorers go. But for me, I'm even more fond, and I think it's more significant, is the Inuit culture and the Inuit history. So um, we're going to learn a lot about um, the oral history of, of the Inuit and how uh, traditions have been passed on from generation to generation. I love the fact that they have not only just survived in this Arctic environment for over 5,000 years, they've thrived. When I asked them, you know, how do you, uh, like, what's your favorite living about here? They have so many things that they're passionate about, so many things they want to tell us. They look at me and say that I'm crazy for li living in Southern Ontario. It's just uh, so amazing to see how proud and passionate they are about their homeland. And so they have a, a very rich history and we'll spend a lot of time learning about um, everything that goes on in their world. And so the communities, um, it's, it's great to visit into the communities and get to see these um, towns that just have these absolutely gorgeous backdrops. I like to describe it as being similar to, um, you know, the Norwegian fjords that have been carved out by glaciation. Um, same in Greenland and same in Canada. You get these very beautiful landscapes and the communities are just hidden away on, on the mountainside. Um, so it's just a, absolutely amazing for photography uh, yeah. landscape enthusiasts. You can get some amazing shots. Really dramatic. Yeah. And it looks like, doesn't it look like they've just been hand chiseled? Somebody's come and just designed the entire archipelago just um, with their own creation. It looks absolutely stunning. And the Canadian um, communities are very different from the Greenland community. So it's good to see both of them, I think. Yeah, the contrast, yeah. Yep. And then I think a highlight for many on our trips is getting to see the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. So you have to pick the right time of year. We're, we're, we're straying away from the summer months. You want to travel into September to be able to see the Northern Lights. You sacrifice a little bit of the warmth, but you do get to see these beautiful, beautiful light displays. So um, just to, to quick recap on all of our Arctic itineraries, you know, we start with circumnavigating Iceland where we witness earth in action, you know, active volcanoes, emerging islands, lava fields, geysers, all of that very interesting geology stuff. Then from Iceland, we move over to, oh, sorry, somebody dropped, I'm just gonna add them back in. From Iceland, we move over to Greenland and we get to explore the beautiful landscapes and we call into a number of Norse sites including the settlement founded by Eric the Red himself. So really really interesting Norse sites. Of course we'll learn all about the Vikings and, and how they um, migrated over the years. Okay and then my last slide is on these itineraries here. So just quickly, our High Arctic Explorer I describe as a mini Northwest Passage. It's a 12-day itinerary compared to our big 17-day itinerary, and it explores sections of the Northwest Passage, but doesn't go right through the Northwest mm -hmm. Passage. Then we have our two biggest trips, our best-selling trips is into the Northwest Passage and out of the Northwest Passage. The, the easiest way to determine between the two, which is right for you, into the Northwest Passage is in August, it has warmer weather, it's going to have the wildflowers, and it's going to have more seabirds. Out of the Northwest Passage is in September. Weather is quite cooler, so the birds fly south and the, the wildflowers die off, but you do get the beautiful northern light. So do you want more birds in botany or do you want to see the northern light? That's typically how you determine which is the, the best Northwest Passage for you. So I just want to wrap up by uh, thanking everybody and again thanking friends at, at Merit Travel. I just want to encourage everybody to get out there and explore. I've been extremely fortunate in my life to get to travel so much at a, starting at a very young age up until this uh, very point. And I do believe that it's very powerful. It can open one's mind, it can open one's heart to, to different experiences, change perspectives, and hopefully come out um, with a better understanding of why protecting our planet is, is so uh, uh, ever important. And you know what? You don't have to go very far to, to go exploring. Like Southern Ontario, you can just go to the Bruce Peninsula and go hiking for a day. I would love it if you come and travel with us and, and book a trip with Jennifer and the, the Merit team. But I just want you to travel no matter where it is. Get out there and, and get exploring and, and enjoy. But once again, Jennifer and, and everybody at Merit Travel, thank you so much for for having me today and, and letting me talk a little bit about the, the Canadian Arctic and why I love it.
Okay, well, great. Great, thank you so much too. Um, it makes me wanna go back, which I will be um, someday soon. Um, just to tell you that we do work with uh, Venture Canada um, very closely. This is Liz Kodlin um, from our Kingston office. Sorry, Liz, if I said your surname wrong there. Um, but uh, Liz and I will be hosts on and all these trips that are listed. Um, some are European, some are uh, Arctic, and some are Eastern Canada. Um, both Lise and I have traveled several times with Adventure Canada, and we really like the way they operate. Um, we like that they have the local um, expedition staff. Um, and as Lee says, as a group, we'll always have fun having dinners together, doing Zodiac, Zodiac rides, plus we'll always have surprises along the way. So um, now we're just going to go to the Q&A. So that's over to you, Annabelle. Um, oh, I actually should mention the promotions that we have with Adventure Canada. Sorry about that. Um, we have, uh, if you book by the end of October, we can give you 15% off the trips. Um, and this is a big thing because I book a lot of single travelers. There's no single supplement. And it's not just for one category, it's for a variety of categories you can choose from. So you don't have to have that inside cabin all the time. Um, also great for families. If anybody's under the age of 30, they get 30% off. And Adventure Canada loyalty program is amazing. On your once you book one trip, you're on it, and you start getting discounts five to up to ten percent off on future trips, plus all some little um, other extras. And um, these are the phone numbers that you can reach Merit Travel or Cruise Expert, which is part of Merit Travel, um, and our toll free number, um, or just go to the websites and you can find um, an agent near you. And we will be following up with an email. And on the email, we'll have links um, to more uh, videos, uh, photos um, of the Arctic from Adventure Canada. And I'll let you take over, Annabelle. Hey, hi, everybody. So there's tons of questions. I hope we can fit them all in. If okay. we can't, we will try to answer them via email. So first question, are there trips in September and October? Yes. Yeah, there's definitely trips in September. October, we start to move south. We're down in and around the Newfoundland area then, but the Arctic in October, or sorry, in September, and that's the time for the Northern Lights. Yeah. What kind of ships do you use? Were they Russian vessels? Were they Russian vessels? No, they were not Russian vessels. The Ocean Endeavor is a converted uh, ferry ship. It was renovated in, in 2015 to an expedition ship. And now she's been, all the cabins have been redone. All the interior spaces have been redone. It wasn't a Russian uh, research vessel though. That's not how it was originally outfitted. It started as a passenger carrying ship, um, an overnight ferry vessel. Okay, thank you. Um, can you accommodate vegetarians? Most yeah. definitely. Yeah. Any, any type of dietary needs, as long as they're, not religious, um, like uh, halal, et cetera. But uh, as long as it's um, um, 30 days in advance, we know we can bring up fresh provisions, fresh fruit, fresh fruit, all of that good stuff. Um, as long as we know 30 days in advance, we'll make sure that you're taken care of. Okay. Are your expeditions super adventurous? If I'm a little older, and I might be, uh, and I prefer a slower pace and want to take in the scenery, but I'm Am I still able to participate in more active activities? I'll answer that one. Because um, okay. I took my dad on an expedition trip um, up the Labrador coast, beautiful landscape. And my dad was 86 at the time. Um, and basically they gear, because the outings, they basically will have local, like they have the guides there. And they, as um, MJ said, they break you up into groups. So I could go off and do a, hall, a big hike and he could just hang out. And that picture that you show MJ of the hare, the caribou and the fox, my dad saw all three of those in one day just by staying with like near the area where you got off the ship and he would just wander around and people would be telling him stuff. And so, yeah, you can be really any age. It's just to be a little bit fit to be able to get into the Zodiac. Um, but yeah, it's definitely any age. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, were some of your photos taken by drones? Uh, unlikely. I can't say for certain. I don't remember where each of the photos were taken, but um, we, we don't use drones for um, a lot of our images unless we have proper permitting. I don't, I don't think that any of these images were taken by drones. Just from high hills, yeah. maybe. I don't know. Yeah, like hikes and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Okay, this one's for you, Jen. As a travel consultant, will you advise us on what to pack for this type of trip? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, when you book an expedition trip, you will always get a package ahead of time that will tell you everything from what's on the ship to what to pack, and they'll give you reading stuff. But I'm because I've done so many trips, I have my own little packing list, and I can advise you what to take. But for sure, like my biggest thing you should always take on these trips is to invest in or borrow somebody's binoculars. And I've lent so many of my clients my binoculars because I just think it's a really important thing to have on the trip. But yeah, definitely I can, I have my little packing list. I can definitely give that and other advice too. Okay. Um, what is the range of the costs? I know that's a broad question. But yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, um, um, that's a, what I can do is I can give you a comparison if you want to compare trips or companies on any type of expedition trips. Um, but there's, you know, if you book ahead, you'll get the category you would like. Um, there's always early bird uh, booking specials. Um, and also just for Venture Canada, I price them out so many times with other companies and um, uh, I think they, the pricing are really good, especially if you're a single traveler because they don't have that single supplement. And also you have to know that a lot of these trips will be always in US dollars. If you see them in Canadian, you'll see that they've just taken the US amount and put it in Canadian. Um, so you have to um, be aware of that. And we'll go through all that with you. But um, it is a trip of a lifetime. And when you go on these trips, um, example again my Labrador trip um, we asked how many people had traveled before and everybody had been to the Antarctic they'd been to the Arctic and they just love expedition cruising it's like a, a fever so it is costly it can be but it's worth it so roughly how much do you think like would an entry level on your shortest duration oh that's not a question you can answer really Annabelle <laughs> okay. Okay. okay sorry you're going I to. I'm going to get everybody to contact you or their consultant. Um, <laughs> yeah. Somebody's asked, and I think you've already answered it, what is the single supplement otherwise? Like if there's no single cabins available? Um, well, they have quads and they have triple. So you could be matched with another person if there's no, um, if there's no more single cabins left. But it depends on the trip. Um, uh, with Adventure Canada, we can talk to them, but that's where you want to book early um, to get your what kind of cabin you would like. And they do have a lot of different categories to offer. Um, and the deposit's only a thousand US dollars. So I think it's advisable to book ahead. And then you get the 15% discount too. Do your trips arrange air or do we book our own air travel or is there a choice? And what are the Arctic destination airports? Do you want to do that one or do you want me sure, to? Sure, I'd love to. So we do, we do offer um, flight options from uh, always Canadian major airports. So either Toronto, Ottawa, or if you're starting a Northwest Passage, it operates out of Yellowknife. And so um, up in the Arctic, we're using communities like Kangaroo-Lusawak, which is in Greenland. It's actually an old US military base. We go into Resolute and then also Kugluktuk. But uh, the benefit of booking our, our air is one, it's the private, private flight. So we can do all of the pre-screening and make sure everybody's safe. And then also we, if our flight is delayed, then the ship will wait for you. But if you take a your own commercial airfare and your flight is delayed, then unfortunately we cannot detain or hold the ship uh, waiting for your arrival. So there's a, a certain level of security with going with our uh, flights as well. And you'll also find that the pricing on our flights is actually more attractive than um, um, a lot of the commercial airfare. We're not uh, making money off of, of the flights that we charter. 
and they use different airlines, like from um, First Air to Air Transat. They, Venture Canada will negotiate um, their um, their deals and stuff. Okay, that was the next question. What air carrier do you use? So you just covered that off. Okay. And this is the last question, I believe. What are the changes the crew uh, that you have implemented due to COVID? Do people have to wear masks on the cruise? Do you clean more? Yeah, very good question. And uh, I'm going to be fully transparent. We're in a, in a position where we made the call quite early that we were going to cancel all of our 2020 expedition cruises. So we're not operating at all in this current environment. We didn't think it was um, a wise choice to be going to very remote communities and possibly exposing um, these communities that have a limited infrastructure. So we're not operating any cruises as of right now. Our first cruise is in June of 2021. So we still have quite a bit of time to see how the cruise industry restarts and really learn from, uh, from other operators as they start to uh, begin their operations. But we already have um, a very detailed plan of what we intend to do, but it might change come the day of, of departure. We are going to be practicing social distancing measures. We are planning on doing pre-screening uh, 24 hours in advance um, with the thermometer and uh, test. We also will be limiting group sizes and dining times. We're going to be eliminating uh, buffets. So lots of measures that we're putting in place to ensure that everybody is uh, kept safe throughout the, the trip. Thank you. Uh, do you have any student discounts? This one really is the last question. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We, we actually have the opposite of a senior's discount. Sorry for all the seniors that are listening in. We, we offer a youth <laughs> discount. Anybody under the age of 30, we consider to be a youth. So congratulations. If you're 29, yeah. you're still a youth with us. Um, we'll get 30% off of their tour cost. We find a lot of um, university students that are doing biology studies, uh, climate studies, things like that are very interested in getting to, to the north, but um, the cost can be quite challenging. We also find that a lot of um, uh, multi-gen travelers would really enjoy bringing their families with them on these trips. And we're finding more and more grandparents that instead of buying their uh, grandchild an iPad, they actually want to take them up to the Arctic and, and uh, go exploring and come home with what will be a lifelong memory that they can hold with them. So uh, we're also offering those 30% um, percent discounts for multi-generational travelers as well. Okay. Any questions? Jen, I'm going to hand it back over to you to do the $500 question. Okay. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is ask a skill testing question. And if you want to get your um, keyboards ready and hover over the chat box and you put your answer in there, and the first person to answer will win the 500 US dollar um, voucher that can be used towards an Adventure Canada voyage. Um, so, drum roll. Uh, name two of the big five animals of the Arctic. Oh, we have oh. a winner. <laughs> we do have He's a winner. Whoa. Fast and furious. <laughs> Um, so the first person to answer oh, wow. was Cynthia Whistle. All right. Congratulations. So nice. Cynthia, we'll reach out to you. We have your um, contact information. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, reach out to you, as I mentioned. And just everybody, thank you so much for joining our talk. Thanks, Matthew James. Um, Thank Fantastic. You. And Annabelle, thank you for being the hostess with the Moses. And um, I just really hope everybody, you stay well and you get to get out there and travel and um, talk to your merit agent and dream with them because it's coming back. Just a matter of time. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, MJ. Thank All right, you so bye. much. Bye. bye.